So let's get started. Um, so I'm here to tell you about stable device tree ABI and that it's actually possible because at last year, or so was it two years ago at ELC, there were some talks about device tree having a stable ABI for the device tree being impossible and that's some kind of a trigger for me. So I thought I need to stand up and prove it's actually possible. Um, so, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Who's this guy telling you all those nice things? Um, I'm Lukas Stach. I'm a kernel and graphics developer at Pangotronics. And what we do is we're a consulting company and we help customers build Linux based on the mainline kernel. So constantly updating systems using recent mainline versions of the Linux kernel. And yeah, we help them reduce the maintenance costs by bringing things mainline so we don't have to maintain them for a customer, but have them maintained in a wider community. So at my day job, I'm mostly dealing with the IDLMX SOC from Freescale, now NXP, which puts me in kind of a good position to claim stable device trees are possible because those are mostly processes that are used for a really lo long times in the industry. So they have really long lifetimes and yeah, that gives us a bit of time to actually get things right. Then yeah, if you have to deal with mobile chips, you're probably in much more of a rush to get things out and get things working and not take the time to actually, yeah, do those things. But what I want to do today is, uh, yeah, so get you motivated about why we want to have stable device tree ABIs at all, and then give you some examples at how you can do it, or at least reduce the risk that you need to break the device tree ABI. So why should we care about a stable device tree ABI? For now, most device trees are still inside the Linux kernel. If they are upstream, they are in the Linux kernel. So most people just consider them part of the Linux kernel. And as long as you change, change things in lockstep, so changing the device tree and changing the driver in lockstep, everything is fine. You're not going to break anything. But now there are other projects like other OSs that are using device trees, think FreeBSD or whatever. Um, there's secure world firmware running on the same system, which is probably using the same device tree. They don't want to reinvent the wheel. And there's even bootloaders now with U-Boot starting to make use of the device tree to probe the devices inside the bootloader itself and Bearworks having that ability since a bit longer. So we use the same device trees we use in the Linux kernel in the bootloader or other yeah, parts of the system. So it would be really nice to keep them stable. So other people don't experience breakages just because the Linux people decided to change something. So one big thing we see a lot is that you have interactions between the bootloader and your kernel. It might not be that you're doing yeah, calls to the bootloader from the running system, but even loading the device tree, the bootloader probably knows a bit more about the system than a fixed device tree you're having in the Linux kernel. Something like um, yeah, what we regularly see is that we have system with different memory sizes. So we don't want to have it in a fixed device tree, but have the bootloader detect the memory size and write the right memory size in the device tree. Yeah, that, that's only possible if the device tree 
is relatively stable. So for a memory, it's not a problem. You have a defined binding and everyone just uses this and it just works. But there's other cases like detecting touch screens or displays in the bootloader or firmware and then providing that information to your running li or the Linux system you are about to start. So you're changing the device tree and that's only possible if it's stable. Otherwise, you would need to have to update the bootloader for that or firmware. And another big point, not so much in embedded, but with all those yeah, single board computers being out there, it's a matter of user experience. So people just try to update the Linux kernel on their devices like they're used to from running a PC. So updating the kernel on your PC is something you do regularly because it's low risk, it just works uh, mostly, but people start to expect the same thing in embedded or boards they tinker with. So it's actually a nice thing to be able to have a working or starting system if you're updating your kernel. Yeah. So let's get into the details about how we get a stable device tree ABI or yeah, freeze it at some kind. Yeah. So I think most people in the room might agree that a completely frozen ABI is infeasible. So did you ever try to design an API or an ABI and never again change it? I don't think that works. So if we would aim for a completely frozen ABI, everyone would just fail at some point and not bother with it again. So let's try to get a definition of stable ABI that's actually possible to achieve. And that's one-way compatibility. So I don't know if, or let's look at the Linux kernel and the user space ABI. We are claiming the Linux kernel user space ABI is stable because we don't break old programs running on the Linux kernel. But we don't claim it's stable so you can run your program that's using new ABI or changed ABI from the kernel and run it on your 2.4 kernel. We don't do that. So if we try to transfer this model of being stable to the device tree, the one thing we care about is firmware and the kernel. So most people are running newer kernels on older firmware, at least in embedded. The one notable exception for that is uh, enterprise Linux that are probably running a pretty old kernel and new systems with new firmware is coming out. But But the thing most people care about is if we push the, fir uh, the device tree down into the firmware, I want to be able to run a new Linux kernel on old firmware. So. And I think if we define that as a stable ABI, that's some goal we can actually achieve, achieve with some work. So for those of you not familiar with the DT process or bindings or whatever. Um, just a quick example. So a binding defines how you define your hardware in the device tree and make it available to the drivers that are actually talking to the hardware. So it has to include uh, the necessary information. So for uh, buses that are non-discoverable like most buses on the ARM platform, um, you need a way to, yeah, the, uh, 
let the kernels or uh, the drivers know what hardware we can find in the system. And the one thing that that we're doing this in the device tree is having it compatible. So the hardware block is compatible with something and the driver checks for the compatible and proves that. So there are uh, required properties in uh, binding, so they must be present in the device tree and there are optional properties that you might have into your device tree to better describe the system or, yeah, have some kind of configuration or whatever. So uh, if you're describing your hardware, leaving out any of the required properties, your device tree is not compliant to the binding, obviously. So how to actually define stable bindings or bindings that you are able to support as stable. Uh, a really important part of that is you go look at the hardware and provide an exhaustive list of all the things you can fi find in the hardware block. Might it be in separate chip or some IP block on the SLC? You really need to look at the documentation and provide everything that's needed like uh, voltage inputs, clock inputs, and whatever as required properties. Um, probably if you're describing a whole system and you have a lot of new IP blocks or lots of new hardware where you need to define uh, new bindings for, you're probably insensitive to just cheap out and only push things into the binding that your system uses. So if you have some chip attached to a voltage rail and it's always on in your system, you might be inclined to not describe the voltage rail in the binding. But then another user might come around and who actually needs a description in the de device tree for the Linux kernel to be able to uh, support that system. So once you define a binding and it's accepted and used upstream, you can't change it in a way that you add other required properties to it because you would make existing users non-compliant to the binding. So what you can do is add other optional properties, so they might be present, but this again has a maintenance cost in the long run because now the driver has to deal with, yeah, a regulator for the water trace may be there or it may be absent and you have to deal with all these complications of, yeah, maybe I need to switch that on now or maybe not. And there are some abstractions in the Linux kernel which make those things a bit easier, but in the long run, those are always a maintenance burden if you have to support additional optional properties. If you can just say in a probe of the driver, okay, I need this, 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 and this, and if it's absent, I'm not going to work with this device, it's a lot easier than doing all the things at runtime. Right, it, it works, but it's a maintenance cost in the driver, so better avoid it. And if you can avoid it, uh, or the way you can avoid that is actually go look at the hardware and try to be precise as possible in the description of the device. So now I'm going over some things we've learned with the i.mx platform in the past years. So if you go look at the i.mx platform, you might not find everything I'm talking about here consistently in the platform. So it was a learning process for us, and I'm trying to yeah, give some guidelines where what we found valuable to try to keep things stable. 
And one big thing is if you're defining bindings for something, be precise and exhaustive in the things you need, but infer as much as possible from either the compatible or the actual hardware. So if you have hardware registers describing your, yeah, your address space or whatever, don't push it in the binding. So you do, things that are in the device tree or the more properties you need or have on the device tree, the higher the chance that someone actually gets it wrong. And if it's wrong, you're breaking someone. So if you can infer something from a compatible, do it. Don't push it in a binding. So, okay, I'm calling names here, but yeah, that's uh, something I found valuable to have it present to you. So um, that's actually a good example with the Tecra controller, not the IMX platform, but some example I found in the upstream kernel, where you have a compatible for different uh, generations of the devices. And then in the driver, there's a list of things that this, uh, this compatible tells you the device actually has those quirks. You can't use that. So it's not in the device tree describing all the quirks of the devices, but it's inferred from a compatible. So if you later on find some flaw in the device where you need another quirk or something, you can actually look at the compatible and add it in the code. So you're not breaking the device tree API to fix things. So that's a good example. One of the bad examples is the network controller and the TI chips, where a lot of the things that are just hardware, so the number of DMA channels, the RAM size that's integrated in the controller and whatever, is in the device tree. So everyone using this device needs to describe those things in the device tree. So if the guy describing the hardware in the device tree gets it wrong, the only way to fix it is fix the device tree. And if you need to fix the device tree, you're breaking your stable ABI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah, one example of how you shouldn't do it. <laughs> so what we've learned is to always use new compatibles if you are dealing with new chips or hardware blocks or integrations. So um, even if the driver doesn't match to that compatible yet, write it down in the device tree for new chips. So what we do with new chips is, so we have that uh, SPI driver on the MX6 ultralight, and we have a compatible for that. The driver actually only matches to that compatible because it's basically the same IP block. So we're using the compatible of the first chip that used that IP block. but we have a new compatible in the device tree in case we find out or later find out that something is broken with the controller and we need workarounds in the driver. So if, you, if we ever find out or find ourselves in such a uh, situation, we can just check the new compatible in the driver and infer the needed quirks from that. So. So what if you actually forgot to add a new compatible for the thing you're integrating? <coughs> so if you're fixing, the, or you might fix the device tree if there's something obviously broken in the device tree and you don't want to spread it further. So you might do that, but before you're going and fix the device tree, you fix the code in the kernel. So 
um, one example, same SPI controller, and this is where we have gone wrong. We have an SPI controller that is actually found on a quad and a dual light versions of the same chip, and we thought, oh, that's the same IP block. So we can use the same compatible and only use the compatible of the first chip in the device tree. And later on, we found out the IP block in the uh, si system integration had gone wrong. So DMA with the SPI controller is actually not usable on that chip. So now we don't have a new compatible in the device tree to check for that, but yeah, we have a workaround in the driver code by checking the compatible of the machines or the SOC. So we just disable the DMA functionality inside the kernel code. So even if you're running an old and broken device tree that still claims that DMA is usable on that device, the driver won't try to use it. So always fix things in the kernel first. So what do you do if you actually need to break a binding for some reason? So you've got it totally wrong and you need to break it to actually support all the functionality of your hardware or something. So there's some questions you have to ask yourself. Is your platform stable? So is something or someone depending on things being stable? And there's a trend in the kernel community to cheap out here and just put something like, okay, my platform isn't stable in the documentation. And that's a really cheap way to get out of all this stuff. So don't try to do this. And you might have new platforms where a lot of things are still in the works and where you might actually, or your users are expecting things to break still because you're in early enablement of a platform and you may break things at that, that stage, but it's not nice to your users. So, and then the second question you have to ask, is the number of users depending on that binding non-zero? And if you, if you can't answer that with uh, confident yes, you probably have users that are using the binding and they're depending on it being stable. So we've had one situation on the IMX platform where we've got binding wrong for the power domain controller and it later turned out that with the binding we've had, we would only ever be able to support a single power domain but the chip actually has multiple power domains. So we wanted to support that and we needed to break the bindings for that. So what we did at this time is actually getting a compatibility layer inside the driver. So you can still run a new kernel with reduced functionality with only one power domain being available on an old DT. So there's code for this in the kernel. And obviously code in a kernel is a maintenance burden. So really think twice if you really need to break a binding. Can you make it work any other way? Don't do it. So what we learned and did in that example is you really want to split out pausing of the old bindings in the driver in a separate function or something. So uh, once you've changed the binding and you reworked all your device trees to use the new binding, the testing of the old binding will certainly decline. So there's fewer users using the old binding and you won't have as good testing with a new or with the old binding. So you probably want to 
push parsing of the alt binding out into some parts of the code that aren't changed regularly. So you're avoiding the possible regressions coming from someone adding another optional property in the new binding and just changes things and then your alt parsing breaks and some year later you're, you actually realize it because someone is still using the alt binding. So just split it out and that's how it looks in the Linux kernel today. So we have the, the probe function and we go look and look if we have a child node with this name, which is only present in the new binding. So we can say, okay, this, that's a device tree that's using new binding. And if we don't find that, we are calling a function to do the parsing of the old device tree and then go on. So. Yeah. Yeah, that might be a possible. Yeah. So in this case, it was easy to infer from the presence of the child nodes because we didn't have child nodes before. But in a general case, probably it's easiest for the driver to just have a new compatible to check and then go past the new device tree or the old device tree binding. So that's it for recommendations. And I think those are actually some relatively simple things you can follow to not make your and the life of your users harder. So um, one thing you might have noticed is that uh, only the first thing I've uh, given as best practice with having an exhaustive list of uh, properties in the device tree bindings is something that is actually enforced by the device tree maintainers reviewing your device tree bindings. All the other things are things that are in driver or platform code. So it's probably not possible for the device tree maintainers to actually enforce stability for your platform or your devices or whatever. So don't rely on them to do that job for you. So if your platform or driver maintainer, it is you who should take responsibility to keep things stable. So all the things I've mentioned are things that can be enforced or at least encouraged by maintainers from a platforms and drivers. So you should probably do that if you're a maintainer. So, and on the other hand, it's often actually not that hard to do the right thing and not break the stability of the device tree ABI. So maybe it's taking you 10 or 15 minutes more thinking about better solutions than breaking the device tree ABI that's 15 minutes well spent because it's making everyone's life easier in the end. And it makes systems upgradable without breaking stuff in every corner you go. So I'm a bit early, but yeah, thanks for your attention. <laughs> mm. Are there any questions? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I've taken the opportunity to have ELCE to actually get the time to put it into a slide. So yeah, now it's just a matter of turning it into a document for the kernel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, that's something we've encountered with IMX with changing or the way how interrupts are mapped on the platform and it was a really incompatible change but you have to be upfront if you're really breaking something. So we've decided that it's not possible to have backwards compatibility at that point because it would just spread all over the kernel. So we've at least made sure that the kernel boots on an older device tree and spits out a big warning to the users that they m might have to update that device tree to regain all the functionality that worked before. So be upfront about breaking things. Um, I'm not sure how often it's really possible to to even realize that the change is incompatible. Um, one thing, obviously, is uh, adding a new required property yeah. breaks the compatibility. Are there others? I don't know. It really depends on the driver, I think. So I've seen a lot of changes where I, as a driver maintainer, see something that might be incompatible with the old binding. But that means I need to know my driver and how it works and relies on something in the device tree and then push back on that change. So I don't think there's a general rule of things that break the compatibility, but yeah. It's really just keeping your eyes open for something you might have seen before. I think most of the time when you're breaking a binding, you're fully aware of it. It's <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm with TI. Um, <clears throat> so I want to disag disagree with you on, uh, on the good and the bad. Um, so the CPSW, which you used in your illustration, is a synthesizable module, and each of those things, well, I won't defend each of them. Maybe, maybe there could have been some defaults there, but could be different on every chip, like Arn pointed out. Um, so what you're really suggesting is that we make encode into the kernel knowledge of each SOC, yes. which is the point that device tree was trying to go away from. And it also, um, your, your solution doesn't work for the enterprise case that you pointed out at the beginning, yeah. right? Because there, <laughs> what we're trying to do is give, be able to write a generic driver that will work even if the kernel doesn't, existed before that device existed. So it's just, I understand what yeah. you're trying to do, but <laughs> I, I just want to give the counterpoint. Yeah, I've got that argument before from the enterprise people, but they're in a much different situation with having enterprise kernels that are probably really, really old, and you might even be able to change your firmware to accommodate a certain kernel because you are able to, yeah, detect the kernel version and then change the device tree in yeah. compatible ways if you so really want to do that. <laughs> but it does apply in more situations than enterprise, because you're teaching the kernel specific information, right? So the same information would have to be taught to the bootloader, to the trusted firmware, to NetBSD, yeah, but, but, you know, all those things. But right? it's possible with PCI devices. So you have a PCI device that generally just has a compatible. It's the vendor and the device ID. Yeah, and, and everything there, known about of, the device is inside the kernel. So yes, it's I possible agree. to push that knowledge into the kernel, and it's right, but been then, done before. But then you, old kernels can't run that PCI device, right? Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to make the counter argument. If you're putting synthesizable IP into your system, 
should do what DesignWare do and actually encode the synthesis options for things like memory sizes into the into a readable register so that when your driver comes along, it can read, say, oh, I've got this much RAM, I've got this much this, and then it can actually make an adjustment because a lot of people do this. Yeah. And we've had to do this with DesignWare, mm. too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that I agree with both of you on, <laughs> on these. Um, I think the most important takeaway here is when you add something that is configurable and di different between SOCs, think about whether it should be a property or not. Don't just assume it should be a property or it should not be a property. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, so hardware engineers pushing things into hardware and making it discoverable makes this job a lot easier. So we've seen a lot of IP blocks where you just need to know, okay, it's in that address space or at that position in your address space and everything else is discoverable from the hardware. And that's a really nice situation. <laughs> okay, thanks for being here. <laughs>